Hello, welcome. Um, Thank I'm you. So to be here. Thank Thanks, you. Emmanuel. My name okay. is Sierra Foxwoods. I'm a senior yeah. program officer with Panorama Global, which is right. a member of the Panorama Group, a community of organizations headquartered here in Seattle um, that yeah. develop scalable solutions to some of the world's most pressing problems. Uh, in my role, I have the distinct privilege of supporting the Type 1 Diabetes Community Fund, a collaborative fund working to improve the lives of people living with type 1 diabetes in low and middle income countries. Um, I want to note that you might hear me abbreviate type 1 diabetes as T1D from here on out. Uh, the T1D Community Fund was created in partnership with the Helmsley Charitable Trust, um, as a way for them and, and hopefully other investors in philanthropy to support local community-based solutions. We currently support 16 grantee partners across 14 countries and to date have awarded over $1 million in, um, in unrestricted grant support to these organizations. We just completed our second RFP. We've received 250 applications and we'll be making funding commitments in early um, 2024, early next year. Uh, we created the Type 1 Diabetes Community Fund really with the long-term goal of transforming health systems and informing health systems from the perspectives of community-based solutions. So those of you joining from the plenary heard Rebecca speak about the importance of empowering and giving agency to leaders proximate, most proximate to the issues that they're addressing. And we're really proud that that's, that's central to our approach here at the Type 1 Diabetes Community Fund. Uh, I'm pleased to be moderating today's session with my colleague, Julia Roper, Director at Panorama Strategy, another one of Panorama Group's organizations that serves as a social consultancy. Um, and together, you know, she helped really define and drive the strategy behind the Type 1 Diabetes Community Fund. So really excited to be working with her today to feature our esteemed panelists. So today we have Emmanuel joining from our development organization, Lorianne from Pillar of Health and Pilar from Cuidar Diabetes. Um, and our agenda today really just aims to be both informative and inspiring. We'll start to hear about the impactful work of our panelists, um, the work that they're doing on the ground, success stories that they're, they're seeing and experiencing, as well as some of the challenges they're, they're facing. Um, we'll talk about some of their experiences working with international funders. And then we're gonna end today's session with some really tangible takeaways and action items that funders can take with them if they also wanna support community-based approaches. Um, and just one housekeeping item before we go forward, there is a Q&A feature on the bottom of your um, Zoom screen or, or webinar panel screen. Um, we will be taking questions near the end of today's session. So if you have a question um, come up, feel free to type that in at any point during um, the, the webinar and we will make sure to get yeah. to your questions at the end. And with that, <laughs> I will take a breath and you. hand it over <laughs> to you. my colleague, uh, Julia Roper, okay. to kick us off with introductions. Thank, Thank you, Sierra. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, as Sierra mm -hmm. mentioned, I'll be support helping to moderate today's discussion. Um, I'm with Panorama Strategy, an affiliate of Panorama Global. We are a social purpose consultancy, and we bring expertise in advocacy, policy, coalition building, stakeholder engagement, and strategy development, including support developing philanthropic strategies where we help clients employ trust-based philanthropy um, principles and help them design strategies for maximum impact. So as Sierra mentioned, I supported the design and strategy for the T1D Community Fund and my team supported the execution of the first round of grant making. And a lot of what we learn comes from partnerships with folks like those on this panel. So I'm really excited that you all get the chance today to hear reflections from them as well. So with that, um, I'm excited to turn it over to our panelists and I'll ask each of you to please introduce yourself by sharing your name, provide a brief overview of your organization's work to drive change on type one diabetes in your communities, 
And as Sierra mentioned, we really want to share today examples that illustrate the power of community-driven solutions. So I'll also ask each of our panelists to share a brief story from your work to kind of help set the scene for our audience. So Emmanuel, I'll go to you first. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Kwafuminta, Executive Director for Arc Development Organization, an NGO based in Isaom, Eastern region of Ghana. We operate in about eight districts within the region, uh, Eastern region and Brong Ahafo region. Uh, this organization emerged through the effort of four young Ghanaian and one Canadian who saw the need to provide community services to the rural communities. I have a passion for improving the well being of marginalized people. I believe in champion advocacy through community mobilization strategies, such as awareness creation and people centered initiatives, demand for T1D services in operational areas. At the government organization, we use community strategies such as uh, 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 young people's parliament. We use young people's parliament in schools. We need soccer for change strategies to drive the attention of the community people to demand for services. We also use community deba. We also engage shrines and churches within their various corners to create demand at the grassroots. Our outreach campaigns serve as a platform to screen community members, especially our children and adolescents. For us, we take pride in improving lives of people living with T1D. For instance, the case of Emmanuel and his family. Emmanuel's twin sister had been orphaned since birth and were raised by elderly parents. During one of our screening services, Emmanuel was discovered to have an abnormal high sugar level. He was taken, he was referred to the hospital for diagnosis. After a necessary test were undertaken, he was confirmed to have type 1 diabetes. Through our intervention support, was provided to his family, to his family, including home diabetes. Through our regular education, medication, and adherence and social support, as well as visitation, livelihood support for empowering twin sister to sustain the family. Now, Emmanuel is able to administer insulin on himself without seeking the service of health professionals. With this, we, can, we came to realization that true management and adherence to medication, a person living with type 1 can lead a healthy, normal life, like everyone else in the society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, Lorian, over to you. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Lorian Sibomana. I'm from Rwanda, but now I'm living in Pittsburgh, so I travel back and forth. My organization is Spirit of Health. So I started this program in 2020 during the COVID. And uh, I used to work with uh, University of Pittsburgh doing research on type 1 diabetes. And I found out there is more need than just doing research. So in 2020, I started this program. It's focused on providing health insurance because uh, people with type 1 diabetes and their families, they could not afford care without health insurance. So what do we do? We provide health insurance to the child with type 1 diabetes and the family. So if 10 people, everybody will be covered so they can able to go to hospital. And uh, it's $3 per person per year. And when you go to hospital, the co-pay is 10%. So to try to make it sustainable, we try to provide livestock, some small business. And uh, as uh, we say, there are so many stories, I cannot really finish all this. But one of the one which I um, we added during this time there is no enough food. So some patients may come to hospital walking five six hours. So they may fall in hypoglycemia. 
So we're trying to have a breakfast in the morning in the hospital so they can eat when getting education from the nurses so they can go back home safe. So there are so many things we can talk about, but uh, this is really a work I'm very proud of doing and I thank you very much. Thank you. Pilar, over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank on behalf of Cuidar, the Type 1D Community Fund and Panorama for the invitation to this important event. My name is Pilar Arrozagaray. I'm a young leader of the Association for the Care of Diabetes in Argentina, Cuidar, and I'm currently in charge of the advocacy and communication areas. I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when I was 12 years old, and in 2016, I was trained by CUIDAR through their Young Leaders in Diabetes program. And without a doubt, that training program was a turning point in my life with diabetes. There, not only did I learn how to better manage my condition, but more importantly, I also understood that there was no point in looking for a why for my diabetes, but for, to look for, for a what for. And certainly taking action that positively impacts the lives of so many others like us living with type 1 diabetes or finding ways to help others from one's own experience is a unique aspect of transforming our relationship with our condition. And it was from that moment on that I started to get more and more involved in the valuable work of my organization. Cuidar is, um, to briefly present to you, Cuidar is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 2001 by a group of mothers and fathers of children with type 1 diabetes. And since then, Cuidar has generated various programs and initiatives. And today, um, Cuidar has six well-defined defined areas of action, research and knowledge generation, access and advocacy, campaigns, education and emotional well-being, capacity building and innovative solutions. And through these programs and activities, CUIDAR responds to the needs of prevention, care, treatment, education, research, access, and advocacy, among other programs. Within each of these areas, there are more than 12 different initiatives. One of them are uh, diabetes go to school, technical assistance to school, mentoring in rights, educational workshops, and, and we generate also data and knowledge from the promotion of edu educational research. Some of them are published in scientific journal journals. And also that data allows us to strengthen advocacy actions as well as to influence public policies and to design and formulate new national laws. I just, I'd just like to share with you a power powerful example of a specific impact that I have the opportunity to witness from CUIDAR and it was when we participated in a meeting with the National Ministry, Minister of Health, which we attended with a group of children and young people with type 1 diabetes. And on that occasion, it was the, the, the children and young people themselves who told a national ministry, minister what it is to live like, um, to like to live with type 1 diabetes and what challenges we face on a daily basis in relation to access to treatment, to health system, stigmatization, among other things. So to have su succeeded in raising the voice of people with diabetes and in first and being able to speak in first person, looking to the minister in, in his eyes, was undoubtedly a huge impact achieved by one of Cuidar's initiatives. So thank you. Thank you all for sharing. Um, we're going to start out with talking a little bit about kind of the value that community-based organizations can bring to public health efforts and to type 1 diabetes specifically. So Pilar, I'm going to turn it back to you again first and mm -hmm. wondering if you can tell us a little bit about from what you've experienced, what do you think are the unique strengths that local community-based organizations bring to public health efforts and type 1 diabetes specifically? Thank you. Well, certainly patient organizations working in the field close to the needs of, of people needs have numerous strengths. I'm sure most of you would agree with me that patient organizations have a powerful mission to improve the lives of those living with health conditions, in our case, type 1 di diabetes and type 1 diabetes in particular. And our work may just not be limited to providing emotional support, advocating for rights, promoting access or providing education. It also includes research and knowledge generation, which is a very huge strength. 
So let's imagine a scenario where diabetes is analyzed and understood only through numbers and clinical data, where the personal experience and day-to-day -day lives of people with diabetes go unnoticed. To a large extent, this is and has always been the traditional approach to research. But this view, this approach has a major flaw. It does not capture the voices, the experiences, the needs, the opinions of those living with diabetes. So clinical data is indeed essential, but it does not tell the whole story. And this is where patients' organizations come in, because our perspective is unique. We capture genuine real-life data every day, and our closeness to the community allows us to understand in a unique way the experiences and challenges faced by people living with diabetes. And we can transform this into valuable evidence and data to improve care, influence decisions, contribute to public policy making. In short, local community-based patient organizations are a, po a, a powerful force in public health efforts related to type 1 diabetes. We direct our direct knowledge emotional support, advocacy, education, and involvement in research are valuable contributions that patient organizations make to improve care and quality of life for people with type 1 diabetes. So from Quidar's perspective, um, based on our knowledge of the patient journey through direct contact with people living with diabetes, Quidar has carried out several research surveys that have allowed us to draw a clear map of the state of affairs in our country and the region on various aspects related to diabetes. And having this knowledge was a key aspect in co-organizing, for example, a regional Congress with another global organization. And in the co-creation of that Congress, Quidar was able to improve and adapt the agenda of the Congress by contributing with specific topics that are actually a priority for the region and that had not been included by the global organization, such as access to treatment. Since that global organization was based in a region where access to treatment, medicines, and diabetes supplies was not a problem, but it was certainly a problem in Latin America and actually the most worrying one. So having all this knowledge is a really powerful um, tool and strength of community-based organization, without a doubt. Thank you, Pilar. That's great. So really how your organization and other organizations like yours have a really strong understanding of the full patient journey and the full picture um, and can really focus on what are the different areas of needs and priorities for the community. I love that. Um, Lorian, would invite you to add your thoughts on this question. What do you think is the unique value that can local community-based organizations bring? Yeah, I agree with what Pilar said. And uh, I think if we look at most funders that are based in Europe, US, Canada, they may not know the whole picture of the needs in the communities. For instance, if we talk about type 1 diabetes, mostly we think about insulin, but insulin is not enough. So people in developing countries, they may need, yes, insulin, but also, let me say, food. Or they need money to go to the hospital. So for us who are working in a community-based organization, we know the needs and that we can be a bridge between the funders and that the community will serve. So I think for us, the good thing about these uh, type of programs is because we can identify the needs in the country and also one need may be in one sector or in one district so it's not the whole country so i think this is way we can be a bridge between the communities and the founders thank you thank you lorian emmanuel anything you would add to that question and then okay, we'll uh, also ask you our next one go ahead okay thank you very much i think my other panelists have said or but i'll add a little to it uh, if you look at the capacity of uh, community-based organization, we have capacity on uh, social mobilization. Uh, looking at Ghana, our setting here, we have uh, remote villages. Example, the way we are, are, are implementing our project is rural and peri-urban. You don't have towns. So we are going to have to reach communities to create demand for the community people to assess their services. So most of the times, as an organization, we are able to uh, uh, build three health centers for the Ghana Health Service. We have a strong collaboration with them. 
So we try to bridge the gap where they have the challenge using the community social mobilization strategy advocacy. Because if you are in the public sector, you can't do advocacy. So civil society, that is our expertise. And we create, when we identify the gaps, then we try to create demand and create the awareness for the policy change and other things within our settings. So we are able to do a lot within that area. And uh, looking at the cultural competency, CBOs understand the local context. So we also have that capacity to create demand at the grassroots level to help, like the Emmanuel case that I just told you. It's through our outreach program to we identify Yima. Other than that, now Yima have a smiley face. I even I invited him to come today, but because of the this we couldn't come. Like we see how Yima before and after. This is the gap that civil society, the capacity that we have to create demand at the grassroots and support the Ghana Health Service to bridge the gap. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, really helpful insights. I think it's clear that community-based organizations should have a unique capacity for understanding the community needs, priorities, as well as crafting solutions based on your deep understanding of local context and the communities that you're seeking to serve. Um, Want to shift gears now and talk about partnerships between global organizations and international funders and community-based NGO organizations. So I think we all know there can be some challenges with these two groups trying to work together. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time hearing from your perspective what some of those challenges are, and then also sharing examples and ideas for solutions. So Emmanuel, I'm gonna ask you the first question on this, which is what are some of the challenges that you've observed or experienced when international funders and community-based organizations partner together? Uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Looking at the context of the international funders and the CBOs, uh, one of the challenges that we face is capital requirements. At times, you are a small organization and you may request for maybe 400,000, 400,000 to carry out an intervention because you have not get that threshold before. You will not qualify for that. And looking at your strategy plan, you have to get some money to do a, a search intervention. And we may give you maybe 50,000 or 80,000. That one cannot help you to achieve the set objective. So at the end of the project, when you do impact assessment, you may not get the rare impact that you're expecting at the grassroots. It's one of the challenges that we face. So they have to look at that. When they do the dual diligence, they have to look at that. Because we have not uh, uh, one fund that we get from global uh, WHO on TBRH. At that time, we haven't had even 50,000 before. But looking at our due diligence that they did, we were able to secure a huge amount from WHO on TBRH to carry out and at the end, we were the first person. We were the first that they give our award that we did very good job. So at the time, they have to give that trust to give out that man that can really achieve something better. Because when you try to put smile in the people's face, when you two are so happy, and it's true, uh, uh, this and so when they give funding to it, it shouldn't be one year or two years. They have to attend like five years. And one of the things is about sustainability plan. When they give you the funding, they won't give you any fund to sustain beyond the project. They have to give you something because you cannot depend on donor all the time. I, I first congratulated our America country, America president and your team. Looking at the money coming from the Europe, I think America has contributed a lot. And we cannot continue to depend on that. So we may need something like sustainability plan as part of any funding that you provide to civil society or CBO, you have to get a sustainability plan to support them so that they can stay beyond your funding period. It's one of the areas that we also uh, face a challenge. And the uh, counterpart funding, at time they may ask you counterpart funding, we have to maybe provide some threshold about some percentage to support. Meanwhile, uh, we don't have that man, but we have our human resource capital and other existing structure that we can use to support the implementation, though they have to consider that. Uh -huh. And uh, one of the reasons that administrative costs at times so they may give you 15% or 10% of the total cost to cater for your administrative costs. So you may not get quality staff to support you to carry out the intervention. 
is one of the areas that we also face a big challenge. So if they can look at that, I think it will help. And the uh, limited duration of the, of the funding range, I've also talked about that. So these are some of the areas that community or CBOs will face challenge in dealing with international uh, uh, organization. And at times, some policies also will not uh, allow us some of the policies. They may require so many policies, this policy, this policy, this policy, this policy, plenty. And we may not admit that is So they have to help us to also strengthen our system for us so that we can meet that uh, requirement. So these are some of the few things that we are facing. Apart from that, there have been a lot. Thank you for sharing. Pilar, can I ask you the same question? What are some of the challenges you've come up against? Thank you. Yes, well, one of the clearest uh, challenges observed from Quidar when interacting, interacting with international funders is when funders focus on supporting only services in which they themselves are interested in or only in projects that can be quantitatively, me quantitatively measured, uh, leaving aside qualitative uh, impacts such as advocacy initiatives. And in this sense, I'd like to say that the impact that can be uh, the impact can be even greater through advocacy initiatives. So when funders focus on direct services and neglect less tangible but still critical needs such as advocacy and public policy incidents, several challenges arises, arise. Uh, for example, short-term vision. While direct services are in, indeed essential, in the long term, advocacy can address systemic problems and create a more favorable environment for long-term sustainability and impact. Another challenge that arise is the reduced ability to influence public policy because this uh, advocacy requires financial resources to conduct research, collect data, participate in relevant meetings and conferences, and also collaborate with other key uh, public key, uh, mm, sorry, key public health uh, stakeholders. So these are many, many challenges. Also, for example, a uh, fragmented approach by failing to address less tangible needs, funders may contribute contribute to a fragmented approach of problem, sol problem solving. Um, there's also a lack of community empowerment. Advocacy on, on public policy incidents can really empower communities by giving them a voice and in decision-making um, tables and addressing problems at the root so it is quite very, very essential. And the, the last challenge that I would like to mention is that not supporting advocacy initiatives gives also a lack of scale. While uh, direct services can have a significant impact at the individual level, advocacy and public policy incidents ha can have an impact on a larger scale, addressing systemic issues that affect many, many, many people. So in short, addressing less tangible but still critical needs such as advocacy and public policy incidents. I think it's it's very essential uh, for a comprehensive and sustainable approach to social and humanitarian work that like say, uh, CBOs uh, make. So integrating these dimensions, I think can maximize impact and create long-term positive change. So I believe it is essential that funders recognize the importance of these activities and um, start to be willing to provide the necessary financial support to strengthen uh, the work of organizations, um, in our case, on behalf of people living with type 1 diabetes. Thank you. Okay, so we have a pretty good laundry list of challenges here. Issues about restricted funding, issues about multi-year funding, needing support for sustainability, um, maybe an over-index on direct services and lack of appreciation for some of the more qualitative systemic areas of need, some fragmentation and how the work is approached. Um, so I know there's a lot, and I know that others, our audience, I'm sure, has bumped into this to these types of issues and others in their own work. Um, but I do think there is hope. And I think from our discussions with all of you, you know, you've shared examples of how other funders um, have been able to make adjustments um, and how you've been able to have effective partnerships. I know we've taken those learnings and we're trying to apply them where we can in the T1D community fund. 
So want to take a moment to hear some of those stories about ways you've been able to overcome some of these challenges by partnering with international funders in the past. So Lorianne, I'm going to turn to you first. I mean, we all know that funders often have their own restrictions and challenges to overcome when making investments. One of which being is, you know, they have a lot of um, requirements around compliance, due diligence, accountability of where the funding goes. Um, and I know you have a story to share about like, partnering with funders to be able to provide kind of the evidence for accountability that they need. Can you, can you share that story with us? Yeah, thank you. So uh, I also agree with what my colleagues told, uh, said, and then we for our organization, we use mostly technology. So if we receive money, for instance, if you want to pay health insurance, we pay electronically, so you don't have any cash to anybody. So that way we can have receipt, we can have records, we can share with our, our funders and donors. So that also increase the trust. And I uh, also think global, uh, uh, Panorama Global, the way they have been so flexible because things change. So if the things change and they have been flexible, that also create trust and that we can also able to move forward as uh, like friends. So that's what I, I, I would say. And uh, But I think also uh, coming back to period of health, able to work with different nurses, the patients, to get to the record that we can share with our funders, that also increase the trust and they're also able to work together. Thank you. And Pilar, I know you've shared with us some challenges that your organization has faced based on the operational mechanisms of how funding is received. And it's challenges that international organizations might not be aware of, have you not told mm -hmm. them? And I know we've had discussions about that with you. Can you share a bit about your story on how some small adjustments had a really big impact for your organization? Yeah, great. Thank you, Julia. Well, I, I think um, in order to be better partners uh, for our, I mean, uh, with organizations, it's essential that funders have the willingness to understand the specific needs and, and situation or uh, uh, the um, uh, country situation of every organization. So in this regard, funders uh, must take the time to understand the unique needs and challenges that organizations they support are dealing with. And this involves actively listening to the organization's leadership, conduct, conducting maybe research on um, the condition or the disease affect, affecting patients they, they, they work for and looking for opportunities to provide support in, in key areas. But it's also important that they can facilitate collaboration and joint learning when working with uh, CBOs. This in, involves fostering open and transparent communication so that a strong bond of trust can be established between the two, the funder and the organization. In our case at Cuidar, for example, we establish, we have received from the Type 1 Diabetes um, Community Fund a grant, but given the extremely difficult situation that we are going through in Argentina with an inflation um, that is running through almost 150% per year and a clump that makes us <laughs> extremely difficult for us to carry out basic banking operations such as accessing the dollars we, we, we've received, the amount of dollars we've received, we had to request uh, that the disbursement uh, be made using the word subsidy instead of grant to maximize the chances of receiving the money in US dollars and not having it converted to our local currency uh, and thus avoiding the loss of value, not only um, due to the difference in the exchange rate, uh, but also due to uh, inflation. Uh, so uh, and um, th th that was only possible because of the openness that the Type 1 Diabetes Community Funds and Panorama had with us and, and the dialogue that was established very transparent and direct, which that is really great because it's a, a bond of, of unique confidence um, between each other. So for us, um, operating in the midst of this extremely hostile context and maintaining the sustain sustainability of all our programs is really a huge challenge. 
which uh, adds to the difficult economic, social, and political uh, context uh, that Argentina is going through at the moment. So uh, again, I, I, I'd like to, to emphasize this, um, the open and transparent communication and the bond of trust that uh, has been built between Cuidar and Panorama's Type 1D community um, fund are fundamental. And this is uh, this was undoubtedly possible thanks to Panorama's openness to offer a permanent bilateral dialogue um, channel and, and its interests in, interest in really getting to know our work, our contextual situation and our difficulties. So I think that's a, a very key aspect to, to bear in mind um, among funders. Thank you for sharing. What I like about that story, Pilar, is that it didn't take something big or major to um, address this challenge you were facing, but it actually took something really small and that was still able to, to have a big impact. Um, I'm gonna give our audience a warning that we're gonna discuss one more theme with the panel and then we're gonna open it up for your questions. So be thinking about what questions you have and you will have the chance in a few minutes to put those in the chat. Um, but for our last topic we wanna discuss, one of the things that has come up in our various discussions together among this group is that ideal partnership between community-based organization and an international funder, it's not only about an exchange of funding and financial support, but that there are a lot of other opportunities to partner together to drive greater impact. So wanna reflect a little bit on that for a minute. Emmanuel, I'm gonna come to you first and ask if you can share you know, beyond financial support, how else can international funders and CBOs partner together to enhance their impact? Okay, thank you very much uh, for this uh, opportunity to also talk about this issue. Uh, over the years, one of the uh, benefits we get, apart from the financial support, uh, recently I think we had some meeting with you and you really give us insights. So that really have really strengthened us and give us about the, the main objective of your project. So one of the capacity that we do receive from the International Resource Mobilization, our here, we have Star Ghana Foundation. They normally give us capacity on feminist advocacy. They also give us resource mobilization, communication skills strategy, financial management and project management, gender mainstreaming, including the gender perspective in planning implementation strategies. So it's also strengthening our system because you cannot just get down and just design your project. You have to do your research and get out the gender sensitive and other areas before you can. So donors have done a lot in that direction. Like you are doing now, it's a lot of publicity and the insight that you are giving to us is going to really enhance our work. So these are some of the things that we do, like T1D uh, community, local advocacy for global action that we did recently with you. I feel also help us in advocacy skills. I think one of our staff have also secured some small funding for advocacy in Ghana. Uh, so it's really going to uh, improve our service delivery and advocacy strategy within our settings. So uh, looking at all this, uh, over donors have supported as beyond providing funding by building capacities for these areas to support, to deliver our mandate. So looking at our relationship with you, if we receive just a mail in the night, 12 o'clock, and I see it in the night, I have to respond. Because you have to respond, you have to be accountable to your donor. So that will create that rapport and a relationship with them. If I see your message, yes, I will not sleep. I have to wake up and work on that because they will see that you are serious and you are really working on providing services for the people because people are suffering and they are dying at the grassroots. What are we doing? So these are some of the strategies or these are some of the benefits apart from financial support we receive from our donors and partners, both uh, 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 your outfit and some of the organization within Ghana here, Star Ghana Foundation. So thank you very much for this opportunity. 
Thank you, Emmanuel. We'll have a separate conversation because we really don't want you responding or reading our emails in the middle of the night. Please do not do that. Um, but thank you. And just to acknowledge that any programming that the T1D Community Fund does is really informed by, like that agenda is set by the grantees themselves. So kudos to all of you if you've enjoyed that programming. Um, yeah. Lauren, over for you to share some examples with us. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, as Emmanuel said, I really am glad we formed this program because I feel like we are friends. And uh, also the way we have like a, what I can call global stuff. So we have some challenges. They may be similar to those in Rwanda or Ghana or Argentina or Kenya. And there may also be some uh, similar solutions. So not just about Panorama Global, but just between our grantees. So we may be from now to be able to share what can we do in the future together, not just depending on uh, like uh, the, the big supporters. We can just have like some conversation. What can we do? What can I learn from Emmanuel or from Pilar or somebody else? So this is one of the outcome I think we're going to get from this program. And also, as Emmanuel said, I love the way we have conversation almost like uh, on a daily basis. If there's something we need, we can ask and we can answer. So I think really that is the way you can make this program more sustainable. Thank you. Great. And Pilar, over to you. Can do you have any examples or ideas you want to share about how international organizations and community-based organizations can partner together beyond the financial exchange? Yeah, thank you. Well, I, I think that maybe other ways in which international funders and community-based organizations can partner uh, beyond financial support um, is to generate positive, um, is um, to, to leverage the expertise on both sides, uh, on the part of both funders and organizations. So to create spaces in, in which to share that experience and know-how about their respective areas of work. So in this regard, funders could offer, in addition to financial resources, technical support and training to patient organizations to strengthen, strengthen their, their capacity uh, and skills in areas such as financial management and strategic planning, for example, while community-based organizations can train both the funder and other organizations receiving the funding um, in, for example, institutional communication, identity building, program development and implementation, advocacy, etc. So uh, this can include uh, developing and providing educational resources, organizing workshops and trainings, assigning expert mentors or consultants, um, which is, I, I think, one of, of, of the best opportunities both uh, for both sides. And at this point, I would also um, like to consider that community-based organizations can build actually capacity of uh, funders in different ways that it would be optimal for them to take into account, um, uh, to take into account um, in different aspects when, for example, designing support for community-based organizations. So in this sense, some uh, perhaps funders could also consider receiving advice from organizations uh, so that they can make the support provided provide it more efficient or improve or facilitate the application processes, expand the communication strategy among other aspects. So I'm truly convinced that international funders and community-based organizations, um, they have a lot of opp opportunities to work and learn from each other. And, and they have the enormous potential of achieving, um, working together, achieving a huge impact um, in our case in the field of health and thus uh, for us in, in Cuidar and, and um, Lorian's and Emmanuel's organizations, boosting life-changing uh, type 1 diabetes initiatives, which impact a lot, a lot of children, young and adults living with type 1 diabetes, which is extremely, extremely uh, great. So thank you. Thank you. So thank you all for your thoughts on those topics. When our when the team of the five of us came together to prep for this session, I know there were a few things that we agreed we wanted to 
communicate to and show the audience. So we wanted to show how critical community-based organizations are in any public health or social impact initiative. We wanted to be honest about some of the challenges that can be faced by having partnerships between CBOs and international organizations. But we also wanted to share some examples of solutions to those challenges and communicate that we believe solutions can be found. And then finally, we wanted to show that we believe there's a lot of opportunity for deeper partnership beyond traditional you know, grant making models to really move the needle on these big issues. So to our audience, I hope we gave you a taste of all of that and now wanna hear what questions you have for our panelists. So I'll hand it back over to Sierra to, to field your questions. Please go ahead and type them in the chat. Thanks, Julia, and thanks all. I'm seeing some great questions and comments in, in our chat here. Uh, the first I'm gonna read is more of a kudos and um, agreeing that, you know, while a good program must always be community driven, it's important for funding partners to invest in overall capacity building of the implementing organizations and noting that CBOs and NGOs face many crucial challenges important to ensuring project success, um, acknowledging that they lack access to, to equitable knowledge and tools. And I think that was really um, speaking to a lot of what Emmanuel was sharing around um, capacity building and, and working in environments where there's lots of um, constraints or policies that kind of prevent um, using, I think, funds or using resources flexibly. Okay, so our first question here, um, and I'm gonna open this up to all of you, to, to either of you to um, answer first. One aspect of receiving multi-year grants is the capacity of the local organization to develop a multi-year plan. Um, in your experience, what has helped you to, to develop this capacity? I'll open it up to Shall anyone who feels moved Shall to answer I take the floor? <laughs> yeah, sure. Thanks, Pilar. Thank you. Well, so I, I, I think that um, a planning multi-year, having a multi-year plan um, is sometimes based on knowing the needs, which are the, the priority needs of uh, people who, who we serve. Because the knowing those needs will will let us know which are the the main activities or programs that we should develop. So, um, I, I, and that can be actually uh, taken into account when when making our plans are as organizations. And most probably there will be programs that are going to be multi year. So I, I think that uh, um, taking into account every uh, always, always taking into account the what, which are the main priorities and needs uh, or challenges that the people we serve, the population that that we serve, uh, are going through. Uh, I think that's a key aspect to bear in mind. Also, when when uh, at every year when when we are doing the, our year planning, and and most probably that that is going to give us the answer of uh, which. How, um, which um, aspects we should develop from for our activities. Thanks, Pilar. Um, Emmanuel or Lorian, anything you want to add to yeah. that around, you know, what has helped yeah. your organization build out multi-year plans? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, one of our strategy, uh, most of the, these are some of us in our operational areas. We are members of the MPCU, that is the Municipal Planning Coordinating Unit. The technical committee. We are part of it. And normally we do their need assessment for them to prepare their medium term plan. So as part of it, we tease out most of the challenges that is in line with our objective. We also partner with Ghana Education Service and we also partner with the uh, Ghana Health Service. I'm the original chairman of Ghana Coalition of NGOs in Health Ghana. And their technical committee, I'm part of it. So normally when they do their annual performance review, I'm also part of it. I get a secondary data from there. Then we do the primary data. We our research. We have a research officer, so he will do the research to get the information from our operational areas, which will inform our decision on how to prepare our 
uh, uh, annual operational plan for the ensuing year because we have our strategic plan, but things do change. So it's very important that we do that activity in line with our annual lesson to identify the felt needs of our community. So this is how we are able to get information to design our annual operational plan and our strategic plan. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, Lorian, I might jump to you on this next question, if that's okay. Um, yes. This next question is um, around, you know, can you share some best practices in the field um, around how impact stories can be created and then delivered back to demonstrate impact to donors? So best practices for um, creating, communicating impact stories to deliver to donors. Yeah, I'll try to, this is very important because when uh, the donors provide the support, they expect some feedback. So, and uh, the community-based organization, we go to the last mile when not just in the city, in the rural area, and um, the way we can, we can either use photos, you can have it there, and uh, like a based on organization, as I mentioned before, when we pay health insurance, we have a report in you know, a computer on the phone, and we can send it back to donors so they can see the money they provide to us has been able to achieve what they were intending to do. And also, as you say about, about the pictures, when you use the pictures on the stories, we can do, we can see where we were before and the way we are now, and we can expect where we're going next. Thank you, Lorian. Pilar, did you want to add anything to that around best practices for um, showcasing impact in the field? I know earlier on you talked a bit about the importance of qualitative measures. Um, supporting advocacy, maybe an example of um, an advocacy initiative that that really showed impact that you could communicate out to your um, supporters. Well, um, yeah, I, I would love to share a, a very impactful story about an advocacy action that we we carried out. I, I must say that qualitative impact, such as advocacy, is much. Uh, difficult, it's much more difficult to show and to report about, but it, it, it definitely is worth it. Um, you know, Cuidar has, uh, from many years ago, has been able to, to sit with different stakeholders and authorities, national ministers, uh, provincial ministers, and, and etc. So at, at one meeting with um, the provincial health minister, um, we became aware that a whole full a whole room of glucagon, um, they, 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 they were lost, like they, they, they were um, not lost, but the, um, uh, the um, just let me look for the word um, expiring date. Uh, the, thank you, the expiring date. Um, they, they were expired, and and at that meeting, I remember that we thought how. Can, how, how's possible that the ones who are um, uh, dealing with all this uh, medication, which glucagon is like a, a life-saving medication for a, a person with type 1 diabetes who goes uh, with a uh, hypoglycemia and loss, loss of consciousness. And how is how's possible that this is not being um, given to people? So we became aware that there, there, there were no registry of people living with type 1 diabetes. So they didn't know how, uh, or how many of them they, they had to give to people and they didn't know where they had to give it because the, there was no information at all. So um, after that, Cuidar has uh, created uh, and promoted a bill for the creation of a type 1 diabetes registry. Um, so as to know how many people uh, with type 1 diabetes is actually living in Argentina and that in that way improving policy and 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 the buyings that the government do for for medication for people living with type 1 or what, type 1 diabetes and nowadays that bill is uh, being um supported by th almost 30 um legislators at the national uh, congress so uh this uh, this is a, um, a result and a qualitative 
a result from all that work of advocacy and 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 all those meetings with authority also gives us gives us information to know what which is the real state of situation and also knowing from the the perspective of people so doing surveys consulting people and 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 having the the word of of people living with type 1 diabetes to directly know which are the challenges they are facing and they are going through every day that that that, that information is really critical um and and well that that is what allowed us to to reach this uh solution of promoting this bill uh which is actually at the national uh congress but i i mean if i should report on the on the impact uh, i think being able to promote this bill is is an impact but as you see it's not an it's not a quant uh, quantitative quantitative sorry uh, measure it's a qualitative measure so uh, it's definitely most difficult if, if we are thinking advocacy in terms of reporting about uh, quantitative measurements but I think this is very very um, important to also report on the on the key aspects of um, um, addressing all these needs because once again uh, dealing with uh, glucagon if a, a, a child with type 1 diabetes has not uh, his glucagon at home he can die so uh, it's extremely important to address these things and, and that's only through advocacy uh, initiatives Thank you so much for sharing that I've heard a couple of themes come out from that story of what we covered today is one, most importantly, like that critical link that community-based organizations serve in generating knowledge and information, whether that's formally, I know you mentioned earlier, you've produced scientific materials or scientific articles or, or less formally around um, surveying and quantifying the need in your communities. And that's that's a theme and a, and a challenge we've heard from many of our T1D community grantee partners is that there's just not a registry or there's not knowledge of how many um, people are affected and how how important that link is to communicate to government or other groups around around that need and, and that that need for support. So again, a, just a really critical um, link that you all serve in the broader ecosystem of, of public health care. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question, and let's start with Emmanuel. Um, this question is, how does your organization typically find funding opportunities? Oh, I think we're on mute. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, we're good. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, one of the opportunities that uh, the strategy to be managed is on the now social media is one of the bigger opportunity that you can use to get uh, some of the this international community to support your course. So we do a lot of publicity. Most of our activities we do a lot of publicity because we have a communication officer who is in charge of doing that aspect. So it's really help us. So your ad, your this is your call. We saw it on the social media, and we try to apply it. And at that time, we apply and that's that also. And that's why they are spent. We are doing skin entities, and we are able to get that opportunity also. And that was last year, the November. We had that two project co currently, and uh, UNICEF also they saw our this and they saw our 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 some of our activities. And we did a call, uh, they did a call and we applied and they also uh, able to get us some funding. They, we ended, but now they call us that they want to continue but because of the good work we have able to do. We have able to document our uh, success story and impact stories and we have able to submit to them. So these are the, if you are able to strengthen your system, the system that you have, and we get this uh, capacity from Star Ghana Foundation. They really build our system internal system of control, the organizational capacity strengthen, they have really and the board everything. So they send an independent is to come and do a due diligence assessment on our, our organization. So this really have really helped us to attract international organization to come also support our agenda. 
Recently, they requested our, our strategic plan, five-year strategic plan, and we are uh, submitted to them. And they want to support us to put us on the philanthropic space to support our agenda. So these are some of the strategies that we use. So if you want to go too far, you have to strengthen your system. The system as organization put mechanism in place. And we have to get your strategy, a succession plan as an organization. So when you are not there, the organization was still running to cater for the vulnerable people in the society. So these are some of the things you are able to put in place to get support from our international funders. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Lorraine, can I? Um, so uh, I thank you for uh, for that question. For me, I will kind of change it the other way. The question was asked. Yes, there is a way you can try to find funding, but do we get it? So as a small organization, it's really hard to get funding. And uh, what I can also acknowledge is type one diabetes. It's not really well funded, not just for our organization, most in general. If we see funds going to HIV malaria, COVID, now we have a war everywhere. So that is really hard because uh, to get funding for type 1 diabetes is still tough. We try to use social media, some connections, that's where you get this funding from uh, Panorama Global. But I think the really type 1 needs to, make, uh, to, to get more funding because there are so many people who need support. And for our program, we support over 3,000 people. And it's not just about health insurance, food, transport. So funding is needed, and it's needed everywhere. Thank you. Well, would you like to answer that as well? How your organization typically finds funding? Thank you, Sierra. Yes, well, uh, we actually do a lot of uh, research on on usually on your internet internet which is, uh, I must say, uh, a really also time-taking time, uh, activity. But yeah, I, I would say that, that that is like the, the main way we find uh, and we look for um, funding, uh, especially from, from abroad, um, on research on, on the internet and, and looking after different pages and foundations and et, et cetera. Uh, but yes, that, that, that's the main way we do it. Thank you. All right, this is our last question um, and a really great question. So T1D is a difficult disease to treat because it requires consistent lifelong treatment. Uh, can you share how that impacts your programming and the work and any challenges you face related to sustainability? Maybe Emmanuel, I'll start with you. Okay, 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 thank you very much. Uh, when designing our intervention, we thought that this is what you just asked, that uh, beyond the project, where are they going to sustain? So we design a little livelihood empowerment program within the project. So those people we identify who need rare need, we do need assessment because uh, we have more clients, you cannot support all, so we do need assessment to identify who needs what. Then we support them with livelihood support program. We train them like Emmanuel. We are able to set up a business for the twin sister in order to take care for Emmanuel beyond the project. Because maybe we don't know what will happen next. So because a lifelong uh, uh, treatment, and uh, we take them to the nutritional education and other aspects so that they can sustain with that. And now if you see Emmanuel is a happy person. So these are some of the strategies as an organization we use to sustain our, our clients. Because that's the only way that can sustain them. Because most of them living with the type 1 diabetes are very vulnerable and they are very poor, poor. So these are some of the strategies we try to build capacity for them and give them some livelihood empowerment program like trade and other things so that they can sustain their family. So these are some of the strategies that we do as an organization. Thank you. And Lorian, you mentioned earlier around, you know, the importance of livestock and um, supporting families and through through social entrepreneurship opportunities. I wonder if you could share a little bit more about this question and, and any reactions you had. 
Yes, uh, type one is very uh, expensive and also, of, of course, lifelong. So it doesn't really just require only one person or one organization. It should be many, it, Ministry of Education, Economic. Uh, so for us, for our program, we found out to providing health insurance was not enough because if we do it one year, we need for next year and the coming year. So, so that's why we try to be creative. We are providing some live stock, which is a way of life also in Rwanda. It's in more businesses. Now we try to give food because people need the food to eat. Otherwise, they will miss insulin. And they also to support with them to come to hospital, to support the nurses. So it's not just for one thing. You have to do so many things. It's almost like a puzzle. So if you do one, you need the other one. So I think to be able to have different organizations coming together for one because that's the way you can try to live to sustainable. And also that is important for the CBOs like our organization. We are there to stay. So we need, we of course, we need support from everywhere we can get. But I think to have organization which is based in the community, and that also will help with the trust with the community because when we come, we come in, we are there to stay. What do you need our help? Otherwise, if you just come and leave, next time they will not even want to come to uh, to see you. So I think to have a different organization to see we can also. To be able to set different stages, what can we do? And to encourage the community, something they can do themselves to not always depending on our support to donors. So there is something they can do. They also, they can change their mindset because type 1 diabetes before was seen as a death sentence. But now we see there is a difference. They think they can do something. So I think really yeah. I must still have hope that we can do something for the community. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pilar, did you want to add anything? Sorry, I, I, I was muted. Um, yeah, I would say that we, we actually, um, in Pilar, we look for uh, all our programs and initiatives to be holistic and integrally addressing those chronic needs. Uh, we deeply know people living with type 1 diabetes have. So whenever getting funding, we know we will be able to cover most of those needs. Uh, we also try to establish long lasting bonds with different funders and, and supporters so as to have uh, su sustainable um, funding for, for our projects. And the last aspect that I, I think it's quite important also for, for all organizations to bear in mind is that for example, Equidar, we, we really look forward to professionalize our work so that we can offer, uh, we can inc increasingly offer innovative services that generate interest in among funders and that also um, are, are every time better for better solutions for people living with type 1 diabetes. So I think professionalizing uh, every organization and, and the human resource of every organization is quite a, uh, an important aspect also to, to bear in mind um, because we'll, our work um, until a cure is, is found will be for our whole life. So um, the, the to look for ways of doing it better and, and uh, with um, innovative aspects every time, I think it's it's a, a very important aspect to um, to to have into account. Thank you, Pilar. Thanks for sharing. With that, um, as we have roughly five minutes left in our session, um, we'll start to close and and do one last lightning round of questions. I promised at the top of the session we were going to walk away today with some tangible action items, some tangible things that we can do in philanthropy, as funders, as partners to help really support the work of these community-based organizations. Um, first, I just wanna thank immensely our panel of um, grantee partners, Lorien, Emmanuel, Pilar. Um, I'm constantly amazed by the work that you do, the commitment to your mission and the commitment to serving your communities. Um, and as Pilar just mentioned that also that commitment to 
um, continuously improve and, and desire to to want to um, improve your work and your reach. And so just first of all, thank you. Um, and I want to echo what Julia mentioned earlier, just as a, as a brief recap of the themes that we touched on today. We talked about why it's important to invest in community-based organizations and the impact that they have in serving um, as that critical link to, to real-time community needs. Uh, we talked about challenges that these organizations face, whether that be limited capacity or, or um, you know, working with funders that have a lot of um, policies and restrictions. Uh, related, we talked about examples of successful partnership. What can it look like when we are in true partnership and there is trust and relationship, like successful relationship building with partners? Um, and then ideas for how funders can provide partnership beyond the check, um, beyond financial support. Again, that technical assistance piece, um, as, as Pilar was mentioning, you know, how, how are we bringing in our partners to help us learn um, and help us do our, our, our work better and be a better partner? So underscoring all of okay. those themes to, to me is just this um, broader macro theme of trust. And so to close today's sessions, I'd love to do a lightning round and in 30 seconds or less, go to each of our panelists. And what is one thing um, that funders can, can do to build trust with their grantee partners? Uh, Lorianne, can I start with you? Hello? Oh. Hello? Emmanuel, yeah. let's start with yeah. you and then we'll come back to Lorianne. <laughs> okay, 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 thank you. Uh, one of the things that we can do as organization, I'll talk about organization before the funders, the organization, we have to communicate openly and transparently with our partners. Feedback, we have to give and respond to their feedback. Is communication is very important. And the other side of the uh, funders, they have to seek input from grantees and involve them in decision uh, making, showing that their uh, expectation are uh, being valued. I think that one will help. And also exchange program, we have to get exchange program. Exchange program also will also help. Uh, so we have to uh, start to build some exchange program, learn and share programs. Then we come, the exposure will also give us a lot of this and to build our capacity and also give us the additional insight on the uh, T1D uh, activities. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, now I'm back. So I think uh, one thing I will say is uh, to be flexible because things can change. The needs may be so many, but the flexibility, both our funders and uh, our grantees, that will help us too. And that because they need also to, to put first the need of uh, the community to listen to, listen to what they want and how can it be done. So I think flexibility is a key. Thank you, Lorian. Pilar? Oh, I think you're on mute. I'm mute uh, uh, once again, sorry. Well, as I previously mentioned, I think that proposing a really open and bilateral dialogue and learning exchange is key to be able to get to know each other, know each other's work, ideas, situation, and also looking to interact, making the most of each uh, each one's capacities. So together, our impact is greater and, and wider. Thank you. Thank you, Pilar. What amazing, more perfect um, closing notes to end on than that. Um, I'm so pleased, again, thank you all for joining today. Um, I would like to close today's session. Just if, if you are interested in learning more about any one of us or any one of our partners um, that spoke with us today, please feel free to reach out to them on the Hoopa app or connect with me directly and I'm happy to put you in touch. Um, likewise, partnership and collaboration is, is core to our approach at Panorama, and we'd love to hear from you if you're interested in learning more about our work broadly or our work on the Type 1 Diabetes Community Fund. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And with that, I will close and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Coming up next at 10 a.m. is our plenary uh, panel on disaster funding. 
Uh, please click on the Zoom link provided in the session description in the agenda to watch your session live. You can also leave comments or questions for the speakers in the Q&A tab in Whova. Thank you.